Hello, and welcome to the Out and Equal 2018 Virtual Summit Series. This is Isabel Porras, Out and Equal University Director. Today we'll be discussing stakeholder engagement in today's polarized environment. This is a one-hour broadcast audio call. Please make sure you've turned on your speakers or headphones and that your volume is all the way up. If you have any trouble signing in, please chat in so we can share a phone number for you to use. If you have any questions or comments during the call, please use the chat box on your left-hand side to share those. We'll be recording the session and it, along with the slide deck, will be available after the call. And we really want to encourage your participation in um, chatting in questions and also participating in a few poll questions. I want to share a few announcements. And I'll be brief as we have some great speakers lined up for today. Again, welcome to the Virtual Summit kickoff. You may have noticed that this year's webinars are a little bit different from previous years. So we're really excited to announce that the Virtual Summit series will take uh, place monthly alongside our bi-monthly global webinar series. We're going to continue hosting town calls as needed, so when Out and Equal has important information to share, when there's a topic that we wish to cover um, that's, that's kind of more timely and immediate, and when we wish to feature panels that weren't uh, at the Workplace Summit. So the names of the webinars may be different, but we will continue to provide you with free monthly webinars on topics of interest to LGBTQ inclusion. As many of you know, Erin Uritas has been named Out and Equal's new CEO. She's fantastic and we are so excited to be working with her. Um, along with Board Chair Michael Cox, Erin will participate in an Out and Equal town call on February 8th at noon Pacific. Please chat in if you haven't already received the invitation and we'll make sure that you, you get that. Erin um, is going to be spending her first year uh, working on what we're calling the Big Listen. So she wants to gather stories, hear ideas, and connect with the community. So we invite you to share your thoughts with Erin via this survey. You should see a link to the chat box. Uh, you should see a link in the chat box to the survey shortly. Our global webinar series will continue in March with multilateral engagement with global LGBTQ business practices, a look at the United Nations. Please note that the date is March 14th, but um, we are still trying to figure out the specific time, so just hold the date. And while we're waiting to finalize details on the February Virtual Summit Series, I do want to highlight our upcoming March webinar, uh, Get Sassy, Tapping the Power of Visible Allies at Work, featuring our partners at Northwestern Mutual. Please check back on our website, outandequal.org, um, as we continue to finalize future dates. And you can always email me at university at outandequal.org with any questions about our webinars or any of our other resources. One more announcement, there are still a few spaces available for our 11th Annual Executive Forum, which convenes LGBT and ally senior executives and business leaders from multinational corporations and federal agencies for two days of professional development and in-depth exploration of the global landscape of LGBT workplace equality. We have some really great speakers and content lined up, and we're particularly thrilled to announce that Rick Welch, CEO of the Golden State Warriors, will be a keynote speaker. You definitely don't want to miss him. And in addition to Rick Welch, um, one of our other keynote speakers will be former Houston Mayor Anise Parker, and we have some great uh, panels lined up on lessons learned from Me Too as well as lessons in intersectionality. So with that, let's turn to today's topic. In today's shifting political environment and organization's commitment to DNI is being judged against how and when they respond to external events that impact underrepresented communities. The LGBTQ community is concerned that reversal of legal protections for trans people may indicate that other rights are at risk including those enacted by employers. Lately, leadership teams are being asked from multiple stakeholders to publicly state their commitment to workplace equality. Being prepared to respond in a timely way is key to protecting your reputation as the best place to work. This workshop was featured at the uh, summit in Philadelphia and was really highly rated, and so I'm so pleased to welcome Wes Combs, Bob Wittick, and Apoorva Gandhi as today's presenters. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Wes. Thank you, Isabel. And um, um, first, uh, on behalf of Bob and Apoorva, I'd like to thank Out and Equal for um, inviting us to uh, 
represent uh, this presentation. We had a very um, lively discussion during the summit, and I hope that today that we can provide you information that will be helpful to you as you are um, advising or experiencing this very, uh, what I would call a never before seen time of um, social and shifting political times, which makes going to work a little bit more challenging than it used to. So um, um, I'm going to get right into it so that we have enough time for everybody to ask their questions. As I said, uh, uh, the three of us will be presenting and each one will um, introduce themselves at the top of their section. And briefly, um, my name is Wes Combs. I'm the uh, founder of Combs Advisory Services, which provides um, thought leadership and strategic partnership to leadership teams who are looking to implement and execute uh, diversity and inclusion strategies, which in this time, uh, in our current climate, is uh, more challenging than ever before, as we read every day in the paper. Um, so I'm going to go over what the current environment is and what's at stake for employers, and we will have a few quizzes, uh, polls during my part of the presentation that you, we will ask each of you to respond to, which will help us get a sense of, with all of you that are on the webinar, what's the issue that's most um, that's facing you, and that will help us give some insights and perhaps share some more questions. Bob will then go into a more detailed description about what are the ways in which organizations can be most effective in how they communicate authentically when it comes to demonstrating that they truly are committed to diversity and inclusion and um, how to ensure that when they say they're committed to these values, how they demonstrate that and the way they communicate and when what's at stake if they don't. And then Apoorva Gandhi um, from Marriott will actually go into a case study of how Marriott themselves has demonstrated that and show some specific examples of very public engagement they've had over the past 12 to um, 18 months. So uh, with that, I'm trying to get my screen to go forward and um, Okay, there we go. So um, if you look at this timeline uh, on this page, uh, this is just a snapshot of the types of situations that have occurred just going from June of 2016 through last year um, that have created a lot of um, um, anxiety, a lot of media coverage, and more importantly, it's affected the individuals who go to work every day in different ways, depending on what demographic group they identify with, as well as where they live and whether or not the, these events actually happen in their cities. And if you look at the events just quickly, you know, the Pulse nightclub shooting um, was uh, for all LGBT people, and those living in Orlando in particular, I think, was um, – it hit very close to home for many of us who often are in gay establishments and there to have fun, and all of a sudden the place that they go to became um, a, a very horrific crime scene. Um, at that time, there were a lot of employees who came to their uh, managers. A, if they have an employee resource group, they went to their leadership, and they had a lot of anxiety. They felt a lot of fear and anxiety, and they wanted to talk about it. And um, depending on where you worked and if you follow the media, media news coverage, there were some public statements made by companies that wanted to ensure that their employees or their customers knew that um, this was an, a workplace that valued um, 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 equality for all and protecting the rights and the safety of individuals who are LGBTQ, and that um, if people wanted to speak about it, what did they want to share with their leadership? Were there safety concerns specifically in the workplace, and, and were the leadership teams equipped to handle the conversations in a sympathetic and thoughtful way? And that was the first of many events that happened throughout 2016 in Dallas. Uh, the shooting, the police shooting there, you know, throughout this year you had a lot of, you know, police-involved shootings of African Americans that was underlying the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. But in this case, and I can tell you personally, because at the time I was the head of diversity and inclusion at the Boston Consulting Group, and our Dallas office was extremely 
um, uh, frightened, uh, especially our African American employees, and they um, there was a need immediately to reach out to them, and they wanted to have a live conversation with the leadership. And our CEO got involved and made sure that at least they knew that we recognized that they were having these anxious feelings, and to hear what types of things um, were on their minds. And many of that was tied to the continuation of providing parity for African Americans in the workplace, but more importantly, that they wanted their leadership teams to stand up and tell the community that this was something that they denounced and that they um, reinforced their own values as a company that um, everybody matters and that this is a place that welcomes everybody. And there were many more incidents that happened throughout the year that are similar to that in different communities, but they, as, but I think it was the election of uh, the president of Donald Trump that probably brought all of this to the forefront where almost everybody was talking about it and there was a lot of anxiety and fear about what the future held with some of the positions that the president was um, speaking about when he was on the campaign trail, but then quickly, as we saw within a matter of a month or two, there were immediate um, changes in proposed changes in, in public policy that it, uh, most, the first one was the immigration travel ban and also statements about women and accusations of the president's treatment of women that led to the very visible marches that we just saw the anniversary of um, this past week. But we also saw a lot of individuals, and many of which, and this happened to us too, we had employees who were outside the country when the immigration travel ban happened. What did that, mat what did that mean for employees? What, were they going to be able to come back in the country? How quickly were you know, employers ready to tell their employees that, A, they did not support this decision, that they were going to do something to fight it, but also what did it mean for an individual who was either out of the country or might be traveling? And so there was a need immediately to talk to your employees, and do people have that ability to speak quickly? And were, or was it a fire drill that created, and the longer it took someone to respond, often what that resulted in was uh, interpretation that the individual employer was either not supportive or didn't understand the issue and was not necessarily committed to um, the LGBT to all to the equality in the workplace and depending on what you know what lens the individual looked at. So that's sort of the backdrop for the environment. I think each of us knows that. And so here's the first question in poll. And so I'd like to ask each of you if you would right now click on the answer that best fits with you. And that is, can you, since the election, have any of you experienced any of these situations at work? Either you have you witnessed an argument over the election of Donald Trump, President Trump, um, an action that he has taken or a statement he has made. Um, and you can check all that apply on this. Um, have you shared your concerns with others um, at work about your concerns about the future of the country? Um, have you seen your coworkers or have you participated in any march or protest to express your opposition? And finally, has your leadership convened any meetings with, the, your, with you as an employee and provide you an opportunity to talk? So if each person would now uh, take a minute to respond and we'll be able to see the responses from the group as they do it. We'll just take, uh, you know, about 30 more seconds to do this. So I'm not seeing the, I'm told there's a very interesting graphic that you're seeing, but based on the data that I'm seeing, that the answer that relates to uh, number two, that the, you expressing concern about the future of um, the, um, where the country is the one, the, by clear, the one that is the leader on this. And then close behind is that your leaders um, convene meetings to um, hear from the employees. And then actually the other two are almost very close behind that. So, but by far more than uh, the leader in that was that. So I think that um, helps people, this reinforces that this is um, still something that people are experiencing. So what does that, what does that mean then? Um, how does this really impact what is in the workplace? And so there's, what we're seeing is that in the workplace, it is not getting any better. That um, since the election, and you can see this in the discourse on TV, and you can see this um, in the way the media covers this, and then in the way that each of you are experiencing this with so many people report, you know, actually 
separations or splits in their own family over chocolate. Um, this is reinforced by much polling data that shows that their um, Americans are getting into arguments, that they are uh, that they are saying that this is contributing to their overall stress levels, and that um, they've seen negative talk at work. And what that translates to is that um, it actually relates to retention. There are some in environments that aren't doing a good job of managing that. There are there's data to show that um, it relates to it it, it. it contributes to attrition. People don't feel safe, and they go to a different environment or workplace that does do a better job of that. It also the biggest problem is that people feel less engaged. They tend to not want to reach out to their colleagues. They don't want to. They don't feel as comfortable share, working in team environments. And so, and this is the last piece. It shows that there's data to show that it actually does impact performance. That teams that are affected by stress actually take longer to solve problems and also more. Um, uh, and actually, their, their solutions aren't as effective. So. What else does so? In the end, what this means is that people want to see their leadership do something about this. They want to see their uh, leadership teams, their CEOs, stand up and publicly say that they are opposed to these actions. That they are they want they believe that corporations have an opportunity at a time when people feel there's a lot of inaction going on in Washington and the people, Congress isn't getting anything done, that corporate America is the place that we, that perhaps there's hope that the speaker, these individual um, corporate leaders speak up, that they may have more of an influence in helping to influence um, the direction of what's going on, but also to um, help to do things when we're not seeing as much change happening due to the gridlock in Washington. And so there's research that says 84% of Americans believe that businesses have a responsibility to bring social change on important issues. It also found that 81% of Americans believe corporations should take action to address important issues, and that 88% believe they have the power to do so. So but what that means in the end, though, is when it comes to the reputation of a company and, if, you know, you work for an employer who has been deemed by the human rights campaign as the best place to work, they want to say, if you've worked, earned this recognition, we want, your, you want you to stand up and always stand up for the rights of LGBT people. And we want to see concrete um, measures that you do that. And doing it sometimes, um, there may be reasons why companies don't always make, take action or they can't share publicly that they are taking action, such as getting involved behind the scenes. And that can be interpreted by individuals as um, a, a lack of commitment, that they're not authentically committed to really making change happen, and that um, there's, not, there's a sense that you can't do it sometimes, that you have to do it all the time. And that means that you always have to stand by your values and you don't get to pick and choose when that matters. And so, all of this in the end leads to these, you know, for me, I always advise my clients that if you're going to be an organization that wants to be recognized in a as best place to work, these are the things that are critical. You have to always demonstrate authenticity, and that means that your actions um, in, with your workers and your actions with the broader community should always demonstrate that you're, you walk the walk and you, that you talk the talk, but you walk the walk, um, that you should be very transparent about what you're doing, what are the goals that you have for increasing diversity in your workforce, do you report on a regular basis how you're doing with those, um, do you share that you've, um, you've had um, customers you know, express their dissatisfaction and are you sharing with all your stakeholders what you're doing about it should um, people have any criticisms about how effective you are or how timely you are with your feedback. And ultimately, I think this is the key thing that we're seeing, especially if you look at the, the, you know, the Me Too movement and um, Time's Up, is that are people paying a price for when they don't achieve these outcomes or when they, um, when they inconsistently um, demonstrate that they are committed to these issues. And we're seeing, I think the one example you can see in Silicon Valley is you're seeing a lot of shifting of uh, leadership of individuals who are in the chief diversity officer role. Um, a lot more boards are coming up and, um, uh, and state and sh shareholders are saying that they're, they're, they want to see something done when commitments aren't met or that the pace of change doesn't happen. So there is a, I think that we're seeing, we're at an unprecedented time, which is different than what would happen when we did this presentation just 
about three or four months ago that there's actually um, even more need for accountability. So let's take a quick look and look at these. Related, to, did your employer make a public statement related to any of these issues over the past um, year to year and a half? Um, um, in opposition to the um, North Carolina HB2 um, um, legislation of um, access to transgender, the transgender issue in North Carolina, um, police brutality against African Americans, the Pulse nightclub massacre, the immigration travel ban, um, the M Million Women March, or the violence that occurred in Charlottesville. So I'm just, if you can say that um, this is a question, did your employer um, 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 and so I do see someone said that there's uh, no choice for none of the above. This is just to indicate which, uh, that's true, there is no choice for none of the above, but this will just get us a sense of which of these issues, what this question was designed to do was to sort of see where, if they spoke up, did people speak up? And um, this may highlight in some cases which issues get more um, attention from leadership and which don't. So the leader in this is right now is the Pulse nightclub massacre, and that may be the nature of the audience that we have here. But we also have uh, the travel ban and then the passage of HPT. So this is just showing, but if you see this, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller number than what we saw in the last poll with the responses. So um, this, is a, this is keeping going, and it seems that the travel ban and that are neck and neck. So let's, um, I'm going to keep going through a little quickly. So, so this is a, um, a quick example to highlight when a company did something immediately. So Microsoft, when the announcement was made by the president on the 27th of January that this uh, executive was being placed, within a day, the uh, president and chief legal officer, uh, both, um, uh, Brad Smith, sent an email to all employees. Uh, the CEO made posts on LinkedIn keeping people informed about the situation, that they were aware of what employees were outside the country, and that they were making it clear that this was a key value for the company and they were going to stand behind their employees and fight against these proposed changes. So this, is, this shows you how the immediacy of what um, was done and they, it was recognized. So here's a question. Um, for everybody, as we're going to wrap up my part here, is that if um, in the context of this, um, which of these can you say that would, would you be more loyal to your organization if the most senior official, CEO, executive director, took a public position for a hotly debated issue? And so I think that um, quickly based on this look is that it's, um, I'd say, um, almost unanimous that this would make a difference in how the individual, and that typically translates to would you look about for another job somewhere? Um, would you be likely to consider making a change? Um, and so the final piece here is that these are the tips that um, Bob will go into more of this on the communication side, but um, it's key when it comes to engagement, the authenticity side, keeping your stakeholders updated on what's going on, making sure that you, they know what your priorities are and that um, they, there's an understanding of how these impact other employees as well as the LGBT employees when it comes to that issue, and that your actions match your values. Um, are you making sure that you keep your communication bi-directional? Are you providing an opportunity for your employees to talk to leadership as well and that you're not just talking to them and that you're consistently keeping them updated? And then, again, on the final part about accountability, is there um, a price to pay if these objectives are not met? And the most important one here, I think, in many ways, is that there are a lot of workforce conduct guidelines that exist in companies. And the key thing is that if someone is not respecting the individual they're working with, regardless of the topic, it's not a sometimes, and this is something we're seeing with the Me Too movement, that, you know, you know vulgar jokes or things that used to be um, slipped by aren't slipping by anymore. And I think we're going to see how that impacts other areas. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. And the final thing here that is that um, these are – the things that organizations can do by making it a priority, stating what their clear goals are, showing that they're, it's a core value, but more importantly, making sure that their leaders live the values and they enforce that and um, build trust with that by doing, uh, having partnerships with um, community organizations that align with these values as well. So with that, um, I will now turn it over to Bob. 
Wesley, thank you very much. I had to take my bad self off of mute there for a second. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for that uh, brisk and important overview of the substance and purpose of today's conversation. Um, from my background, I've uh, spent almost four decades now in, in strategic communications with about 10 of them on Capitol Hill working with the senator and Senate committees. And to me, um, the voice of uh, public policy from the Hill is not unlike today uh, corporate voice, the corporate voice. In fact, in a climate of political uh, both uncertainty and discomfort that we're witnessing, corporate America has a deeper obligation and a more profoundly sensitive and meaningful opportunity to give voice on the values and issues that we care about. Um, as, as employees, Wes pointed out the, the upside and the disadvantages of failing to, to capture that voice. So I wanted to speak to what we've learned over the last, say, 25 years, in fact, of um, thinking about this, about LGBT issues especially, but not exclusively. In 25 years, in the last 25 years since I've been uh, consulting with a lot of corporations, I've been look, looking at it through a lens of then and now, which I want to just frame for us because things have changed so drastically and for the better in many sense because I think uh, finding the voice of corporate America and co uh, corporate leaders is something that we have learned how to uh, use strategically. But you, you, you remember at the beginning the risk was so uh, palpable to many companies when we saw the, the Disney boycotts and the other blowback towards corporate leaders. There's a great anxiety about, it, uh, about entering what was called either social issues or the political arena in way, ways that were harmful and, and uh, destructive of a company's both reputation and its investor value. Um, and working Wes and I, when we had worked together for many years, started working with American Airlines. People don't remember this. They've been a leader in LGBT um, engagement and respect for almost 25 years from the beginning. But at the beginning, interestingly, pre-Internet, there was a time when uh, radical right or extreme right uh, forces actually invested in front, uh, not front page, but they invested in full page newspaper ads opposing American Airlines for taking, um, for endorsing the so-called gay agenda. So even at that time, it was clear that there was a voice of powerful repercussion and risk was palpable. And also LGBTQ leadership within uh, the corporate arena was centered mostly or largely principally on HIV, AIDS, health and well-being issues. And so it was focused entirely on what Benny would consider to be social uh, value and philanthropy. And so therefore avoid issues that were more uh, third rail, like gay marriage, for example, or, or the promotion of same-sex relationships. And most of the focus that companies took at the time when they began to find their voice was aimed at internal stakeholders. The rise of the ERG movement that many of us are part of gave us an opportunity to have real dialogue inside companies between us and them. <laughs> the CEO meeting with LGBT stakeholders and actually getting to know us and realizing we we did have voice and deep loyalty to the to the brand. And again, backlash was real, though it was unpredictable. It was um, across the board. It, you couldn't predict at any moment when it might happen because many companies, I think, didn't become targets. The Disney's, the American Airlines, and some of the ones that were the outliers or, I would say, leaders have been the ones that, I think, took uh, the brunt of it at the beginning. And, of course, without the Internet at the time, the echo chamber was short-lived. You could get... Um, uh, a great deal of outrage, and imagine though, you had a full page ad in the New York Times, but again, it would appear one day and then it was gone. And uh, here it is, 20 some years later, and no one remembers that that ever happened. So those those opportunities did not echo and reverberate forever. Today, there's far far more reward. Uh, companies have seen that they have uh, struck and struck <laughs> struck a balance or struck a chord that reflects public attitudes. Public attitudes now are shaped around the same voice that public advocates use. They see them as uh, the equality arguments, the respect arguments, the um, inclusion arguments have made a huge difference and above all, the coming out, the visibility of LGBT people in public spaces have made a huge difference in terms of understanding the reward. The business case is far more clear. We have so much more data. Companies have been emboldened because they have an authentic business rationale. 
early on, 20, 25 years ago, when we were beginning to uh, communicate this, companies were asking these kinds of questions. How many gay people are there? Where do they live? What do they spend on? Uh, what, what are their lives like? Are they the same and different than than any other consumer, any other employee? But that, that case has long been made, and now it's a global case, which is the exciting thing in the 21st century. It's not a U.S. case. The stakeholders are changing because today we have ERG leaders who are that voice and members have trusted voice of management. In fact, we are management. We serve on uh, corporate boards. We are CEOs like Tim Cook. We are fewer in numbers in many of those places in senior executive ranks, but the, the, the significance of people are coming out has reshaped um, multinational corporations around the world. And in strength in numbers, companies are not by themselves in any sense of the word. We're working clearly across coalitions. Uh, every time we turn a corner on a major state or federal issue, we are joined in uh, armies of uh, companies. Uh, uh, news reports this week have suggested, without without uh, evidence that it might change, but um, the the battles over religious freedom legislation last year, in fact, the transgender bans, that had emerged as political um, lightning rods in states from Texas uh, all across the uh, the nation, North Carolina clearly, but also Indiana. In uh, all those states, those were um, fires, flash fires that uh, corporate America stood by. And today, this year, we're getting signals at least. We don't know if this is going to remain true. It's still early in 2018, but uh, state legislatures have discovered that should they uh, light the match, that there's a lot more corporate uh, blowback for them. So that is powerfully great evidence that that's changed. And, in fact, it did it did do the job in many cases. We don't know for sure how long that lasts, but let's hope. And also that we are partners. What's happened, the out and equal uh, model is really changed uh, the, the uh, universe of possibilities because corporations are not on the outside looking in and nonprofits are not on the inside looking out. We're actually working together. That did not exist 20 years ago, and giving a voice to this has been the chance to bring authentic business and, and advocacy voices together that speak the same language, which did not occur before then. Now, let me give you my 11 commandments. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, Moses only had 10, so I have to beat him. Um, but these are certainly not commandments. In my vernacular, these are really ways of thinking about messages. Because companies have to think through some filters and lenses. Uh, we're often asked when I'm talking with uh, corporate communications leaders or diversity leaders or senior executives, the questions they have to ask themselves is where, how, and when can we best give voice to the issues that we care about? We know we care as human beings and fellow coworkers, and as Americans, we have a, a great deal of depth of character about the issues we care about. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that um, uh, we press the send button on everything that comes across the uh, the corporate bow. So I want to I want to deal with these in the the way I think of them, and I think uh, many of us think of these are ways that we filter this. Corporate values are, to me, the foundation. A corporation, in its uh, mission statement, its value statements, its uh, aspirational language, it expresses what its values are. So to me, uh, if those values are true and real, they are actually actionable and must be expressed. They can't just be written in brass uh, over the door of the company. They can't just be put in your uh, annual reports. They have to be expressed in a variety of ways and applied to real real world experiences. This year and last year we see evidence of that. A lot of companies have been using their corporate values to express how they feel about Black Lives Matter or when uh, the Million w Women's March or certainly on LGBT issues. We hear the, the resonance of those values expressed. Selectivity uh, for number two I, I always want to point to is we have we have choices to make. Um, companies have to realize too that um, that they they not on and they can't be to be effective or to be influential at times. Can't be uh, on all barricades at all times. What they have to do is really be mindful of where and when they can use their influence for the the most value. And companies, of course, in uh, multi-state employers and multinational employers, are looking for places where it really does make a difference. Where their action is going to be perceived as both influential and 
bring along others uh, like-minded companies on that on their same wavelength. And so we understand that they do that for those reasons, and that they want to make sure that what they're doing is effective. And I, I speak to this all the time. A 360-degree review is rather important because it simply is, reflects the fact that no matter what it is we say or do, an action or a message, it does affect um, a complete orbit of, of all the stakeholders. And the next one speaks to that in the internal and external. But the 360-degree view really is really profoundly um, uh, instinctual for most executives. It's the notion that everything we say and do actually has consequences in every direction we face, whether it's with our consumers, whether it's with our associates, whether it's with our potential hires, whether it's with our business partners and our subcontractors. It's it's the orbit of everything that you do. And most companies, I think, have gotten reflexively the skill set to think in that way, and they don't have to, in fact, uh, hold ballot measures internally to weigh, have everybody weigh in. Sometimes they have, but in this case, it just gives them a sense of knowing that we have to have everybody spy in. Internal and external stakeholders is always important because sometimes a company, for example, feeling deeply disturbed by events knows that, as Wes had mentioned in his anecdote, when events happen in Dallas, they're going to affect the um, your universe there more deeply. And so at different times, you're going to choose among stakeholders that you're going to uh, express it to, not differently, but more emphatically or more personally or in person, face-to-face. You're going to take a, a deeper dive into the stakeholders that have got to listen to you. And sometimes it's your own workforce above all. Consistency is clear. We simply have to make sure that what we're going to say today is to a, a separate group or another population perhaps has to be consistent with what we'd say to them. In the LGBT space, I think we've all heard this before, there's been a, a, a rash over years of exceptionalism that no matter how we would treat other groups, marginalized groups or groups that are discriminated or, or populations, sometimes LGBT people have felt that the policies or the messaging didn't apply to them or applied it a different way because we accepted them in a different way. Consistency is really uh, the strength of, of, uh, of character of a company to get it consistent across everybody. Timing matters because waiting too long, it can be a problem. Or going out too fast without all the information, also a problem. You want to make sure that you're armed with sufficient information. You want to make sure that you have really vetted internally the timing that makes sense and is right. And you don't want to linger too long and be the last one out. Um, because in, in things like the uh, the, uh, the violence in Orlando, that was a case where human human humanity, compassion should rule, and you have the opportunity to speak human to human and express it in a way that timing really makes a difference. Messenger is fascinating because, of course, not every message belongs to the top messenger. The CEO's voice should be used on certain very important primary key occasions. Um, otherwise, you have many other messengers within the company, the diversity leadership, or you might have the the, uh, the voice of your lawyers uh, express it. And so the so the, the voice uh, of where it's coming from has to weigh in in terms of its significance, its importance, its historical measure, and exactly what we're speaking about. So, so that's going to be something I think companies understand and use it properly. The action taken means, of course, what is the thing that accompanies it? Are we actually going to do something, change a policy, go to the courts? Are we going to uh, uh, urge uh, some action on the part of our uh, uh, workforce? Are we going to give up a significant sum of money to a, a, a event, a tragedy event, and invite our associates to help contribute? There are a variety of things that actually should be considered, and if you're going to do them, figure out how you're going to do them well, properly, and successfully. Uh, media channels, of course, is as a communicator, you always have to weigh. Uh, for many of us, of course, we know our president uh, favors one media channel, well, two or three, if you count in Fox News in addition to Twitter. But um, across those media channels, you have a lot of choices to make. Companies are using Twitter in a lot of interesting, creative ways, and Facebook, uh, along with other social media, in order to really allow uh, what I consider to be more dialogue. They say things and respond to things in real time. Um, so they have an opportunity to reach people quickly, and they don't have to go through a filter, a third party like an editor, a broadcaster, or a blogger. They can say in their voice on 
restricted and uncensored exactly what they need to say. And they have to hear the feedback of others. But those channels have given them a great deal more liberty and latitude. And then, uh, of course, precedent. Have we done this before? It doesn't mean we don't do it now, but uh, is this something that we've been comfortable doing and saying? Should we say this because uh, if there's something going on in, in uh, Afghanistan that affects us, do we treat it with the same sense of urgency that we treat something in Brooklyn? Um, we have companies that are obviously uh, have their footprint all around the world, and doing the precedent means treating people uh, alike or situations that are alike in a like way. And so we have to understand whether or not we've achieved that and take the precedent that uh, that matters. And then finally, most important perhaps of all, what does success look like? If we're going to uh, act and react and speak on issues and policies that are, you know, a, a sense of deep urgency, when we do that, what does success look like? What does it change? Does it change reputation? Does it give us a share of voice that grows respect and loyalty in our workforce? Has it created opportunity for us in the marketplace that's more meaningful? Um, so staying silent or being uh, out there is it, both of them have their opportunities and and uh, and uh, pitfalls, but again they have to be driving a long-term business strategy of being in the right place at the right time, saying the right thing with the right voice. And uh, for LGBT issues, we've seen evidence that uh, a great many companies have that confidence and and, uh, and voice today, and they didn't have that 10 years ago even, I think. Certainly 20, 25 years ago, they didn't at all. They were as invisible as we were in many of the marketplaces and workplaces in America. But today, they do have that full conscience, conscious voice that addresses populations and it speak our language and with us, not just about us, but with us. And I think that's profoundly important, especially right now, this year, when we see evidence. There's a GLAAD survey with the Harris Poll that came out this week and it's highly publicized, talking about the year of triumph that we experienced, certainly in 2016, has turned into almost a year of backlash in many ways. And so we know that um, the voice and the lightning rod that, that uh, corporate America uses today is probably our best single platform for advancing our cause when uh, the political environment is so challenging, difficult, contentious, and frank frankly ugly. And um, so I think we're lucky if our corporations today and the ones that all of you work for are giving voice to these changes that um, uh, remind us that we can get through this together. Well, I'll leave it there, and I want to uh, introduce my very good friend, colleague, and client, um, Porva Gandhi with Marriott, because I think he can put some rubber on the road in terms of how they do many of these things and how they take these uh, commandments into into their own thinking. Great. Thank you so much, Bob and Wes. Uh, first of all, I want to say good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you so much for um, joining up. Thank you, Out and Equal, for inviting me to be a part of this webinar. And um, Always thanks Wes and Bob for uh, your ongoing uh, counsel and, and help. Um, again, my name is Apoorva Gandhi. Uh, I work for Marriott International. Um, and uh, my title is I'm Vice President of Multicultural Affairs. Uh, I do want to reassure all of you that my job is not to go around the world having multicultural affairs. So I just want to make sure that was very clear uh, from the outset. Um, and uh, my role is to uh, you know, really engage with our diverse communities. Um, and one of those segments that I work very closely and have the honor of working with is the LGBT community. And it's one where um, I really have enjoyed um, telling our story at Marriott, about Marriott International um, to this community and, because I think it's one that I think really resonates well and we share the same goals. Uh, so what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about our culture and a little bit about how um, it's not just something that you see um, on the walls of a conference room. It's something that we back up with our actions and our engagement with great groups like Out and Equal and the Human Rights Campaign and National Center for Lesbian Rights and PFLAG and IGLTA and uh, NGLCC and so many others. So um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Or am I supposed to do that? Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, it, it's when you have Arnie Sorensen as your CEO, 
Uh, he really makes it easy in some ways. <laughs> uh, he's such uh, an amazing champion of inclusion uh, for everyone. Um, our corporate culture is about taking care of the associate, and by taking care of the associate, we can take great care of a customer, which is hopefully all of you. And, you know, he, he really talks about, you know, words matter. He sees, you can see here he talks about the importance of the words that we use. And yes, action matters as well, but also words do matter. And what do I mean by that? Is that, you know, we have to be speaking about inclusion and equality in a lot of different places, everywhere. You know, it's not just something we speak to when we're talking to diverse audiences. We don't just talk about marriage equality when we're talking to the LGBT community. We talk about it everywhere, no matter who the audience is, because it's part of our culture of always putting people first, and that means all people. You know, we can't have two sets of rules at a company. Uh, and we definitely don't have two sets of rules at Marriott International. We're about taking care of everyone. And um, I'm just so proud to work for a company founded by Mr. Marriott and his father and led by Arnie Sorensen. And you can, talk, you can see here that we've been working very um, keenly to overtly communicate to all communities and especially in the LGBT community because of the anxiety that's being felt very recently. So I think, and we all think that it's important for people to hear big companies like ours, you know, we're the world's largest hotel company now, and we want to be the world's fa most favorite hotel company. But for folks to hear these words, to get, to hear big companies talking about them, to hear senior business leaders talking about it, such that it becomes normal and, and part of the normal lexicon of how people speak. Um, you know, sometimes people will say these words with air quotes, and we don't want that to be that way. We want it to be something that people hear and feel very comfortable um, talking about. So, and you can see Arnie has spoken in the past at, at, at NGLCC. He has spoken at Skift and at PFLAG and so many other places. And the thing we're most proud about is not just Arnie talking about it, it's other leaders as well. Stephanie Lenartz, who's one of our senior business leaders, was just at Davos yesterday uh, speaking at an LGBT summit uh, that was led by um, Accenture and, and the Human Rights Campaign. And you know, speaking about our, our dedication to inclusion. Um, you saw on the slide before a picture of myself speaking at the Alton Equal Summit a few years ago, you know, talking about our story and frankly, my personal story um, in this area. So when we engage, we engage with purpose, and we want to talk about it in all different areas. We can go to the next slide, please. And you know, it's it's speaking up when things are going well, and it's also speaking up when there are things that are out there that we think uh, are not right, and uh, things that are just plain wrong that we won't stand for. And many of you will remember in Indiana a few years ago uh, when our now Vice President Mike Pence was advocating for the so-called religious freedom law, um, you know, our, our leadership felt it strong to speak out against it. And, and, and in fact, uh, at the PFLAG Straight for Equality Gala, Arnie Sorensen came out very strongly, um, you know, the notion that you can tell businesses that you are somehow free to discriminate. He actually called it madness. It was picked up very, um, very widely on, on major news sources that here's a big company calling this madness and talking about how not only is it wrong for companies with associates um, from all walks of life, employees, it's just bad for business. So we were very proud to uh, speak out against it, and we backed it up with, with other actions, which I think we'll talk about on some of the next slides. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, this again goes to the point, you know, we're out talking about this on CNBC. We're talking about it uh, in front of all these different audiences um, and in the blogs that we write. It's not something that we shy away from because everyone deserves to be welcome. And if you're in the hospitality business, we're about welcoming everyone, uh, no matter who you are or who you love. Next slide, please. And. Uh, you know, it, it, it's something that we don't shy away from. You can see here Arnie Sorensen, after uh, this last election in 2016, penned an open letter to President Trump, 
posted it very prominently on our social media, on LinkedIn, and tweeted about it. Um, and you can see the line here, the government has no business in our bedrooms or our bathrooms. And you know, we want folks to be comfortable in their true self um, just as they are. Um, and I want to reassure all of you, if you come to a Marriott Hotel, and there's um, a lot of them these days, about 6,000 plus around, uh, you know, uh, around, all around the world, we want you to feel comfortable who you are. And we showcase that in our Love Travels campaign, hashtag Love Travels. We showcase that with our policies, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think many of you have, have seen some of these. Next slide, please. I see some questions coming through, so I'll, I'll speed up here so we can try to get to some of those. But you see how our words and actions um, are in sync. Um, and here's the list of some of the ways that we show that by signing, signing on to amicus briefs uh, regarding the you know, religious freedom legislations, you know, things against that, um, the, the famous marriage equality case um, supporting um, you know, the, the right of equality and the right for marriage equality. Uh, we, we clearly um, spoke out and signed on against this anti-transgender legislation in North Carolina and Texas, um, and, and more to come. We're not a company that shies away from this, and um, we're very proud because it's all about putting people first and taking care of our associates so that they can take great care of the customer, no matter who they are or who they love. Next slide, please. Okay, so do we want to, um, Alyssa, should we jump, or Isabella, should we jump into some of these questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much to all three of you for this excellent presentation. We have a few great questions in just an interest sure. of time. May not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we will certainly share them with our speakers after. So uh, the first question is, is sort of broadly, I think, directed to all three of you. Has the tone of diversity discussions changed in Washington, D.C. this past year from your, previous, from your prior experience? So I'll, I'll take quick. Change? Okay, Bob, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, you want to start in there, Wesley? I was just going to say that I think I, it's, I echoed it in what I was saying. I think that um, no longer are um, organizations um, capable of not having these conversations. I think what we're seeing that's a big difference is that more and more employees, regardless of their position and what part of the organization they work in, are publicly um, letting their leadership know. But what they're doing that's different is they're doing it on social media. And there's a lot, uh, the, you know, while I don't always like using the term millennial, but the generation that currently is in the workplace, they have no qualms about letting um, their employer know or p the public know how they feel about the actions of their employees. So there's companies can't ignore it, and those that do do it at risk for what will, um, how it will get out of hand, even if the information is inaccurate. And I'll turn it over to Bob. I, I would just simply add, um, we have um, we're at ground zero in Washington in a sense because when we have remarks that are so polarizing about Charlottesville or about Dreamers or about uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, it's so polarizing that silence is now seen as consent. And um, I think companies get it that um, that void has to be filled with positive and affirmative rejection of those positions. Um, they fear, we all fear, we all fear the same uh, slope that we're on, and no one wants to um, consent to allowing that to be the so-called new normal. And companies, I don't think, have any, um, I don't think they have to inhale anymore to think about it, because um, people are afraid. They have workers who are afraid. They have uh, workers' families who are afraid. And for all those reasons, I think that they have been the change agents, and that's why many of them, as we all know, have uh, withdrawn from these uh, advisory panels and councils at the White House. They uh, they don't want to be complicit. Yeah, I would agree with both what Bob and Wes said. This is a poor um, It's important, you know, to always have a if when you have a strong cultural company culture, you can point back to and be proud about. It makes these discussions while they're tough. It doesn't. It makes it somewhat easier because you know from where you stand, right? And also I would advocate though, the, the, the diversity discussion and tone has clearly changed in the last couple of years or since the election. 
And I think, though, it's one where I agree with what Bob is saying, that, you know, you have to quickly and swiftly, you know, reject these, um, the, these opinions that are very contrary to equality and what your company stands for. But at the same time, um, I always say, you know, part of it, though, is having hard and critical conversations with people. Um, you know, it's funny, when I talk to people, I can always sense that sometimes folks want to quickly get into the Fox News versus MSNBC discussion. And honestly, we don't want that. What we want to do is talk and, and listen and try to have productive discussions. doesn't mean that you change what you think, but it's about having productive discussions where you listen, we listen, they listen, and maybe it's something where you have a couple conversations, and maybe about a third or fourth time, you slowly, each of you understands each other a little bit more. doesn't mean you have to change what you think, but at least they're productive discussions versus just getting into the yelling matches. Thank you so much for that. I think we have time for, for one more question. So I'm going to, again, this is for, for all three of you or anyone who wants to jump in. Someone writes in that their biggest challenge with leadership is that their organization employs um, 350,000 people but serves millions. And leadership says they don't want to stand up for something that may disrespect the views of half of their constituency. So their viewpoint is that it might be, quote unquote, right to us, but that many of these issues are divisive and it's not fair to support half and um, disrespect or infuriate the other half. To them, to the, to the leadership, it's better to stay silent. Do you have any tips on how to push back on that, on that um, concept? Yeah, I, I would do this. It's Bob Wittig speaking. I would say um, it's, it's, it, that, that point of view, I understand it. I hear it as well time to time that these are yes, no, black, white points of view, and we're not going to be able to make any headway when that's the case. But that's not exactly the right perception that should be brought to the issues. For example, the, the frame around these issues that we're speaking to, I think, is we're opposed to violence. We're opposed to um, uh, bias, we are, or, or more importantly, what we are in favor of. We're in favor of equal respect. We're in favor of, you know, in other words, there are values that companies have that are actually more universal. And without taking a position on a particular, let's, for example, say in a, in a uh, police brutality conversation in which some people feel there's right and wrong inside of uh, he said, she said, or what actually happened, the events that happened, we can stand back from the event itself and not take a position on who acted badly or wrongly. Those are issues that legal uh, forums will settle. Our position is to understand that um, the people of color especially are feeling um, d defenseless against um, um, the uh, culture that unfortunately has tended to victimize uh, their families and friends in communities. There are ways to address that concern and cultural um, uh, fragility that are not taking a side in a polarizing question. On LGBT rights, it's the same thing. It's not saying that we t we're siding with LGBT people over people of religion or faith. What we're simply saying is that in the marketplace, everybody should be welcomed. And in doing so, though, we think this position is, is the one that's going to reflect that the best. And that may mean signing an amicus brief. It may mean signing on to a petition or a value statement. Or it may mean not signing on, but still evidencing it and voicing that, that, uh, that uh, value. Yeah, Bob, uh, I'm sorry. This is a poor of a, I agree a million percent with what Bob just said. Again, it comes back to your corporate culture. If, if you know, it, if you're offending people by talking about equality, well, that, there's a, then there's a problem with that person, right? Um, you know, when we talk about taking care of our associates, it's about ensuring that everyone can be who they are and their own skin and have equal access to benefits and, and the benefits of marriage and the benefits of, of equality. Um, that's what this this, our company is about that. So yes, we, we talk about these issues because we also recognize that our associates, you know, live in live in these cities where our hotels are, and they they deserve to have the same benefits as anybody else. So a much a lot of it's about business for us, about welcoming everyone, but a lot of it's also about taking care of our associates and making sure that they're comfortable, um, frankly, having a good and equal life. 
Thank you all so much again. We're, we're just at 1 o'clock, and so I one more time want to uh, express our thank yous to Apoorva, Bob, and Wesley, and just remind everyone that is still on the line to uh, join us for our next town call, which will be on February 8th. Uh, meet our new Out and Equal CEO, Aaron Uridis. And if you have any questions, you can still chat them in uh, for the next minute or so, and we'll be sure to share those with our um, speakers and, and follow up one-on-one -on -one as needed. So again, thank you to our speakers, and thank you to all of you for joining us on this webinar.